And so begins the final chapter in Barack Obama's presidency. Republicans sweeping the midterm elections, taking the Senate and forcing the White House's hand on key issues like immigration reform, Iran, Russia, Syria, and Iraq. Incumbents almost always lose in midterm elections, but roll back the clock two years and remember the Democrats' strong show with a growing electorate of minorities and women. And that had the Republicans painted as the party of angry old white men. This time, the Republicans even elected an African-American senator in the Deep South, a first in more than a century. That broaches, the core, of course, the logical next question. The Wednesday after midterms can also be seen as the first day of the 2016 presidential race. What uh, kind of candidate, in light of last night's results, can now claim poll position? Today in the France Van Gette debate, will it be gridlock or compromise? With us from Washington, Bruce Stokes of the Pew Research Center. Thank you for being with us here again. It's great to be here. We'll be joined shortly by political consultant Ellen Wasilina, Republicans abroad here in the studio. Jake Lamar of Democrats Abroad. Jake, whose latest novel in French is called Posterité. Thank you. What's it about? It's about a painter, an abstract expressionist uh, in the 1950s, um, who's also survived the Nazi occupation of Rotterdam. So that's a, it's a big story from it starts in 1940, ends in the 21st century. Hopefully soon to be translated in English. Hopefully. The France Van Gette debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and on Twitter, our hashtag F24Debate. The Wall Street Journal calls it a shellacking for Obama. Uh, the headline in the New York Daily News uh, screams, nope, BAM drags down Dems, uh, it says. Uh, the Republicans extending their lead in the House of Representatives to the widest margin since the 1940s. In the Senate, a six-seat majority has now turned into a seven-seat deficit. Bruce Stokes, are you in any way surprised? Well, I think the uh, magnitude of the Democratic loss and the Republican victory is what is surprising. Everyone in Washington uh, assumed the Republicans would take control of the Senate and retain control of the House. But I don't think that there was anyone who was predicting uh, the number of Senate seat pickups that the Republicans gained, plus the impact that had on the down ballot uh, races, the governorships that the uh, Democrats uh, did not gain or, or, or lost, uh, and the impact on the House of Representatives. Uh, so uh, the the uh, a huge loss, uh, uh, Bruce. Again, you have to explain it to us here in Europe. You have the highest American growth in nearly 10 years. Unemployment is down. Obamacare was not as big an issue as people thought. What happened? A uh, couple of things. Uh, one is that even though we have 5.9% unemployment, which is fairly good compared to where it was in 2009 and 10, uh, we are still about 6 million jobs short of where we should be uh, because of population growth. Second, we've had uh, wage stagnation for years. Uh, actually, if you go back a generation, we've had more or less wage stagnation, growing in income inequality, uh, rising frustration with the performance of the government and specifically the performance of President Obama. Um, and uh, in the last month or so before the election, rising fear among the electorate about issues uh, taking place outside the country, 55 percent of the Republicans who voted yesterday uh, were, were worried about, said the biggest issue for them was foreign policy, uh, which is uh, highly unexpected uh, even a month ago, and they were more worried about foreign policy than they were worried about health care or the economy. More worried about foreign policy than health care or the economy. That's, that's a that's a topic uh, we're going to pick up on, of course, with those foreign policy issues that, that lie ahead. I want to say hello to Ellen Wasilina. Paris traffic could not keep her away. No, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> thank, thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Uh, let, let, me, let me first turn to you, uh, uh, Jake Lamar, uh, listening to Bruce Stokes there. Were, 
Were you expecting this as well? I wasn't expecting it to be. Uh, the, it's the magnitude of the victory, as uh, as Bruce Stokes said, that really surprised me. But um, but you know, speaking of foreign policy, it wasn't really foreign policy so much as fear about the outside world, terrorism, Ebola. Uh, that was mainly the foreign policy message. The 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 general broader message had nothing to do with the economy or anything else. From what I've seen of the campaign commercials and the rhetoric, um, it was mainly about the demonization of Barack Obama. Um, and I think certainly we know what to expect having seen how the Republicans have functioned for six years so far in the Barack Obama presidency. There will be more gridlock. Um, they will continue to try to thwart his agenda. I don't see them willing to compromise. Um, I congratulate my friend Ellen here, but I'd caution her not to get too uh, uh, um, confident about the future because uh, Democrats have won, uh, by the popular vote, five of the last six presidential elections. George W. Bush's first term, he did not win in the popular vote. Right. Democrats have won the popular vote five out of six times, and the Senate could turn and switch back to being a Democratic majority in 2016. But for the last two years of Barack Obama's presidency, I think this is a disaster. All right, uh, Ellen Wasilina, this fear of the outside world, does that mean we're headed towards a more isolationist America? Well, I think you have to go back to 9-11 to say that the United States, of course, has needed to regroup and restructure, pulling out, out of Iraq too early saying and promising that we need to pull out of Iraq. Certainly, there are issues inside America that need to be fixed. However, I completely agree with you. There's a fear of the outside. You know, there's periods, too, of isolationism that America has gone through. Uh, foreign policy and fear at this time, uh, obviously, the agenda of the president, the way he's handled some of these issues like the red line in Syria, uh, other issues that we have not seen fortitude on. Uh, the Republican agenda, obviously, is peace through strength. Uh, our country needs to be strong. Our country needs to lead. Uh, isolationism certainly... So, so hang on, that's a contradictory message, isn't it? On the one hand, you have to be strong and lead. And lead. And on the other hand, you don't want to interact too much with the rest of the world. No, no, that's not it. You know, many of uh, the U.S.'s allies, and you can all talk to them, they expect and wait for leadership. You talk about defense in Europe. Europe depends as well on... U.S. leadership, U.S. defense. There are other issues. This pivot going east, Europe is saying, well, what about us? And who's going to assure our defense? So uh, the U.S. certainly has to regroup and solidify inside the, the U.S. The economy is a big issue, 62.7 percent of participation. The labor force, don't talk to me about unemployment figures, okay? There's other issues uh, that need to be addressed as well. Bruce Stokes. If, if I could jump in here. I, there is, it seems to me, a cognitive dissonance uh, in the American body politic about uh, the engagement with the world. We uh, did a survey uh, late last year, and uh, in answer to three separate questions about whether the U.S. should more or less let the rest of the world mind it, do its own thing and we mind our own business, should we stay engaged or not be engaged on strategic issues, uh, the public was as isolationist as it has ever been, higher than uh, during oh, the Vietnam the War. War. But then when you specifically ask people about s specific issues, for example, 57% uh, um, uh, of Republicans before the election and 65% of people in the Tea Party uh, want to send troops into Syria and Iraq to fight ISIS. So that's pretty interventionist. Uh, basically, Republicans are very critical of Obama for not being tough enough on Putin and Russia around Ukraine. So, so does this mean even Americans they, they are didn't fickle? support sending troops? Um, I don't think it's fickle. I think we have to understand that human beings are infinitely capable of holding mutually contradictory emotions at the same time, and <laughs> and uh, and the public itself is is uh, divided on these issues. Republicans, who let's face it, put these. GOP senators into office now, and these House members into office, the GOP electorate is, uh, is expressing on specific issues a desire to be more interventionist. All right, a question coming in from Madiba Leader on Twitter. Can someone explain why Obama's so unpopular? He reduced unemployment, good growth. So what's wrong with Americans? It's, it, it's the question I put a little earlier to Bruce, Bruce Stokes. 
Why is Obama so unpopular? And he is unpopular. Oh, yeah. Well, well, well let's, let's look first at the economy, because something quite extraordinary has happened. There's been a fantastic rebound of the American economy. 3.5% growth, unemployment down two entire points from two years ago. What's amazing about this recovery and what's relatively new in, in American society is that the, 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 the rising tide has not lifted all the boats. From FDR through Bill Clinton, when there was a resurgence in the economy, it was felt by the middle classes. Now corporate profits are higher than ever, but people's salaries have, have not just stagnated, they've receded. I mean, the average salary, I think, is 8% lower today than it was in 2008. Barack Obama cannot make the ruling class uh, pay their employees better. There's something that's really happened, and I think part of it is the mentality of people in the famous 1%. Um, this sort of uh, extreme social Darwinism, the idea that if you're rich, uh, uh, that's the most important thing. If you're poor, you deserve to be poor, even punished for being poor. I think there's a real poison in, in the way people uh, people view society and wealth and poverty. So that explains why more I mean, people could, turn I, to Republicans than in this election. They're upset by the president. The president's to blame. The great question, and Ronald Reagan's great question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Can't the economy's are. better off, but people are not. It's, it's, it's an unusual dichotomy that only began under the presidency of George W. Bush in 2002. Bruce Stokes. I mean, the irony, and the irony here is that on four separate state ballots, there were referenda to increase the minimum wage, and they all passed. And one would think that uh, that would draw out people who are more likely to vote Democratic. Uh, if it did, these people came and voted to raise the minimum wage and then turned around and voted for the Republican for governor or senator. Um, uh, so uh, I think it's hard not to conclude that uh, this was an anti-Obama vote. When we ask the public before the election, when you cast your ballot, uh, how much do you, is this going to be about Obama? And uh, that happens in every off-year election. People were voting against George W. Bush in his sixth year. And this year, people said, especially Republicans, said they were voting, casting their ballot against Obama. Uh, casting their ballot against Obama, is it because of income inequality, as Jake Lamar just said, Bruce? Or is it also to do with the man himself and the way he's governed? I think, I think there is great disappointment based on the expectations of Obama as president. Um, uh, and it has often been a judgment not on what he did, but how he did it. I'll go back a year, uh, last September, when we, he drew a line in the sand and said, if uh, the Syrians don't get rid of their chemical weapons, we're going to bomb them. Uh, he then uh, decided not to do that. And the, we surveyed the public, the public said, so absolutely, we don't want you to do that. Um, so he found another way to get the chemical weapons out of Syria. We then asked people in the, in the American public, um, how do you feel about the way he's handled the Syrian situation? And they said, we didn't like it. So even though he did exactly what they told him to do, they adversely judged the way he did it. And I think that is um, uh, the tale. Are of you the suggesting that part of a good, being a good leader is not listening to pollsters like yourself? <laughs> no, no. I think the uh, the the it's the execution of the policy. I mean, the reality is, if you look at health care reform, uh, whatever you think about health care reform, there are now more people enrolled in 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 the Obamacare program than were, were anticipated. But the rollout of that was so mishandled. Uh, that there's still a legacy of distrust of the program, of antipathy towards the program in general, even though people like the various uh, individual aspects of it. So again, um, I do think part of this is not what he has done, but how he has done it. Yeah, if, if, I, if I could jump in here, too. Uh, there's, there's also a real problem in, com in the communications department in the White House. I mean, this is, this is, people don't know that there are 10 million people who have health insurance today who didn't have it a year ago. They're just very bad at getting the word out. But to go back to the viewer's question, I think there is, as Bruce Stokes said, disappointment among Obama supporters. Um, there is, I think, um, a reasonable criticism, uh, certainly about the red line, um, if you want to look objectively at what Obama has done. But when it comes to Republicans, especially Republicans in Congress, this was a conscious strategy to thwart Barack Obama. Mitch McConnell, who's about to become the, probably the, the Senate Majority Leader, 
He said early in Obama's presidency um, that the, most, the single most important thing we want to achieve is for President Obama to be a one-term president. Imagine a senator saying that in, at the height of a financial crisis. He didn't say save the economy. He said make sure Obama's a one-term president. This strategy of obstructionism was decided the, the night of Obama's um, um, uh, swearing in. January 20th, 2009, a group of prominent Republicans, most of them from Congress, decided that the way to deal with Obama was to not deal with him, a strategy of non-cooperation. It didn't work in the sense that Obama was reelected, but the obstructionism right. continued up to the point of a, a government shutdown last year. That's an important point, the, the fractious relationship between the White House and Capitol Hill. Uh, will it now continue with the Republicans or even get worse now that the Republicans are going to be in charge. Derek on Twitter saying, remember, the President of the United States is the chief executive. He can function without the Senate or the House. Uh, in other words, he can rule by decree, is I suppose what he's, what he's insinuating. Are you expecting things to get worse, or will we see, like we did in the last two years of Reagan's administration, of George W. Bush's administration, when the opposition controlled Capitol Hill, compromises? What about Clinton's administration? Clinton was able to work with the House and the Senate being Republican. Why can't President Obama do it? So now is the time to step up to the plate and say, OK, I have two more years left. Talking about his legacy, he wants to leave something, as every president does. Why can't he now work with the Republicans and give it the last two years a best shot? It's not only saying that Republicans are on the side. It's also the policies. Okay, the way they're implemented, choice or not choice, we know that Americans want choice. Look at the economy. You talk about low unemployment rates. I have to come back to this. We have the lowest participation rate in the economy, as I said earlier, 62.7 percent. What kind of jobs are available for Americans now? They're low-paying jobs. Should we raise the minimum wage? Probably. Okay, so... And that's something that he's asked for and the Republicans have said no to. Sure. But I'm just saying there's other ways of working with the Republicans and not saying the Republicans are obstructionists. It's also the policies that don't, they have to meet halfway. Uh, but Clinton Al was able to do it. But Why Al Alan, 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 the do? problem is uh, uh, prominent senators and congressmen, including Paul Ryan, along with former Sp House Speaker Newt Gingrich, sure. decided before Obama had proposed anything what about his that healthcare? they would stick with this strategy of obstruction. Are we gonna it was the day he was sworn in. What about in. his health care? They, they were against that before he proposed it. We're going to pick up on this when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate.